Um, and we have a great array of speakers here um, today. I want to first of all congratulate um, Heather and Heather Conley and Carolyn Roloff, uh, colleagues here at CSIS, for the production of this report, which I hope you've all had a chance to get and which is available electronically online. Uh, this is a terrific and very timely piece of work that brings together, as we'll hear from Heather, uh, in one place, a lot of data, a lot of analysis, a lot uh, situates it all in the context of what has been going on up to this time in, in, in engagement in the Arctic on the health. What do we know and what are the possibilities here in terms of concrete additional action by the U.S. government in its chairmanship? Uh, of the Arctic Council over the next two years, which begins, as, as, as Heather's pointed out, uh, next week. And so uh, we're delighted that we could partner and that uh, Heather and Carolyn could produce this really excellent piece of work. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Congratulations. That's terrific. Senator Murkowski this morning, uh, in her speech, made a very powerful point, and that was that all action by the U.S. government and other governments in the Arctic need to put the human uh, reality, the individual and the community at the center stage in discussing the future and in discussing uh, the approaches that are going to be taken. And so we, I think this gives us a, a wide open door uh, for talking about these issues and where we are going to go. Uh, we're, the, the, the way we're going to do our business here today, we're going to ask Heather to give a quick synopsis. Uh, of the of the report and what it contains. Then we're going to move uh, in sequence. We're going to have Pamela Collins, who is a, uh, a psychiatrist and an MD, director of the Office for Research on Disparities in Global Mental Health at the National Institute of Mental Health. Pamela uh, thank, came, to, came to us. We've known each other a little bit over the years. Roger Glass, who's with us today. Roger, thank you for joining us. Uh, Roger kindly connected us. And thank you, Pamela, for coming and being with us. Pamela uh, will we'll roll through eight, eight or ten minutes of presentation uh, on the work that uh, NIMH uh, is leading in this area. Uh, we will then move to Dr. Michael Bruce, epidemiology team leader of the Arctic Investigations Program for CDC based in Anchorage. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, he will walk through the CDC program uh, in, a, in, a, in, in some detail as well. Uh, we're using this really as an occasion for getting these two lead U.S. agencies to tell us what they do, tell us what, has, what the major challenges and issue focus will be and what the future might look like in terms of continued work, intensified efforts in this area. Uh, Dr. Bruce is the epidemiology health leader and has been putting, has put a predominant focus upon a wide range of research and studies across uh, vaccine preventable diseases, chronic diseases, health disparities, chronic disorders. Uh, so we're thrilled that Michael's with us. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Timothy <clears throat> Heleniak, who is a research professor at George Washington University and a leading polar uh, expert. He's a, mig he's a migration and dem uh, expert and, and demographer uh, who's been working um, uh, on polar geography and polar environments for his entire career. He's one of the contributing authors to the newly completed and newly issued about a month ago Arctic Human Development Report, which I hope some of you have had a chance to look at. It's a very comprehensive encyclopedic 10-year study. Uh, it builds on the 2004 study comes out, it's, it's full of uh, enormous amount of insight and detail. Um, and uh, we were very fortunate through Heather's intervention to enlist Timothy to come down here today to be with us. So Tim, thank you for making the journey to be with us. So with that, once we've rolled through the presentations, we'll have a bit of a conversation among ourselves, but we're gonna move to you all very rapidly to get your, uh, your opinions and comments. Uh, so please be ready for that. And Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Steve. And uh, it, it's wonderful to be able to have such a great partner. Steve and I, our offices are right beside each other. And I'll tell you how this idea came about. We were talking, and I sort of 
gotten the nickname at the office, the Polar Princess, the Arctic Queen, because I do so much on the Arctic. And he goes, you know, we should do something together. We should collaborate together. Uh, how can the Global Health Program be a part of this conversation? I said, funny you should ask. Uh, health is really not an issue in the policy space that we focus on as much. We know the U.S. chairmanship, uh, one of the major themes is the, the economic and the, the, the livelihoods of people in the North, a focus on that. And we really need to pull this information together. What do we know? What is the United States doing about it? Uh, and then, of course, I said the timing is perfect because we know uh, the Arctic Human Development Report, which first issued in 2004, so it, it, as it was issued, it was a 2014 report that, that was issued a little bit uh, later in February of 2014, uh, 2015, we'd have 10 years to see what has changed, where, where is the focus that we need to, to, to do. So all of these elements came together uh, and really encouraged us to, to put this report together. So many thanks to the Global Health Program for, for being part of that. And of course, my colleague uh, Caroline Roloff was absolutely instrumental in, in developing uh, this report as well. I just want to, you're so sick of hearing from me today. I'm going to be extremely brief, and I really want to hear from our panelists. This is part of, I'm going to bring, take my notes and be copious. Uh, I want to learn a lot here too. But I just want to do a couple of highlights uh, in the report. Um, I think the, the first thing that, that strikes me, I think it strikes anyone that doesn't know this topic and begins to read it, is the huge challenge of mental health and suicide prevention. A recent epidemic, this comes from our report, a recent study uh, has found that every five degrees of increased northern latitude, suicide rates increase by 18%. Now, just to bring this home closer uh, for the state of Alaska and Alaska natives, the rates of suicide have increased 500 percent since 1960, with rates four times higher among 10 to 19-year-old Alaska natives than their non-native peers. This is striking, and it, and it certainly is a, a huge crisis. There are uh, contributing factors, uh, uh, suicide, uh, substance abuse and violence, and there's just a whole issue of mental health challenges that are profound. And if there's one thing we hope this study does is reinforce that urgency um, and, and bring new focus to it. There's other pressing issues um, that just require continued focus. Uh, the change in food habits, food security. We're seeing increased rates of obesity, diabetes. We're also seeing a heightened uh, impact on the food security of environmental contaminants and mercury. And, and some of these things is from the changes in the climate, but also as, as uh, uh, the food cycle so dramatically changes. But the Arctic picture is a complex one because there is no one model. Um, you have a very different health spectrum in the circumpolar Arctic where health indicators in northern Europe, the Nordic countries is far different from what we see uh, in, other, uh, in other communities. And so the challenge for the Arctic Council as it's developing its thinking is how, there's not one size fits all, but how do you meet the needs and how do you bring the study, the information, the focus together. So there's lots of information in the report. Welcome you to read it. I just wanted to uh, conclude by highlighting some recommendations. And, and two, I think, are particularly perhaps provocative to some of our State Department colleagues. I am a proponent of really rethinking the Arctic Council's governance structure in light of its uh, 20th birthday, which we will celebrate next year. It was designed in 1996 for one purpose, but as we've just talked about over the last three and a half hours, so much has changed. Do we have the right alignment in our working groups? Do we have the right alignment in how uh, the Arctic Council meets these challenges? So we very provocatively recommend that we, the Arctic Council should really think about having a working group designated for Arctic health and well-being. If people are at the center of this policy, which they are, I, we have a, a flora and fauna uh, working group. We have the protection for the Arctic marine environment. I would like to see a very focused working group on health. If we think it's important, we put it out there. And so, as I said, I know that, well, whoa, that's a, that's a pretty uh, provocative recommendation, but we think actually it's the one thing that could perhaps be a legacy for the U.S. chairmanship and moving forward. The second linkage, as you've heard from Senator Murkowski through our, our discussion on uh, uh, energy resource development, 
Well, we really found in our report there is a link between economic development and growth and mental wellness and, and, and well-being. And maybe we should be a little bit more specific about that uh, linkage, where people have uh, livelihood, their, stat, their, their, their living standards are increasing. Can we make that, uh, that linkage? Can the Arctic Economic Council have a direct role in how uh, the private sector, public-private partnerships are engaging in some of these pressing health issues for Arctic uh, communities? And of course, as part of all of this is how do we engage traditional knowledge in, in working towards uh, uh, an improved Arctic health and well-being picture. And I think, again, the working group, a new working group, could bring that traditional knowledge in. We have some other recommendations. Obviously, it is our hope that the U.S. chairmanship focuses like a laser beam uh, on these issues. We know mental health, uh, mental health and suicide prevention is part of it. I know our colleagues are, are going to give us some great insights on what the work of the, their agencies are doing, but we want to we raise this up. We want to highlight it, and we certainly want to impress upon policymakers that uh, this is a critical issue that demands our full attention. Uh, as, uh, Senator Murkowski talked about the young people and their enthusiasm, we can't have Arctic young people not seeing a promising future and committing suicide. So with that, Steve, thank you so much again. Thank you. Pamela? Thank you, and thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Of the many opportunities and challenges we've heard discussed this morning, I'm going to focus in on one of those, which is the area of suicide and suicide prevention. Just to orient all of you, uh, this graph, oops, I'm pressing the wrong one. <laughs> this, uh, this graph shows you some data on suicide rates in the United States over the last 20 years. The red line shows you homicide rates in the United States, which you can see have dropped substantially over the last 20 years. Suicide rates have increased by about 17% from 2002 to 2012. And in 2013, there were about 41,000 suicides in the U.S. And to give you a sense of when we're talking about these circumpolar communities, where do we stand? So the, the bottom red arrow shows the U.S. suicide rate in comparison to other countries and sub-communities in the Arctic. The top red arrow shows you the suicide rate in Alaska. And one of the main takeaways from this point is that, first of all, just to orient you, the yellow bars represent Nordic communities and regions, Nordic countries and regions. The green represents Greenland, which you can see at the very top. The blue represents Russia and regions in Russia. And um, the red is North America and regions. So the, as I mentioned, the bottom red bar is the United States suicide rate. The top, the red bar by the other red arrow is Alaska. So clearly, the rates in Alaska are higher than the U.S. Uh, population in general. Um, and if you what you can also note from this slide is that as you go higher, the bars that are the higher rates represent, often represent indigenous communities compared to the country totals. So there's considerable variation across regions and variation within countries with indigenous groups often at a much, much higher rate, uh, risk for suicide. These are data from Alaska specifically. And again, because just to orient you to what the lines are, the bottom line in yellow shows non-native Alaskans, and these are females, non-native females suicide rate. The next line, that little jagged one, are Alaska native females. And then above them, the brown line, non-native males in Alaska. And that top line represents Alaska native uh, young men and, and men. So again, huge differences by ethnicity with um, and, and certainly regional variation within Alaska, too, where there are certain communities in Alaska that have s higher suicide rates than others. So this is a complex problem. It's not the same everywhere. But clearly, this, this group of men, and young men in particular, are the group that are at the highest risk um, among Alaska Natives. The conversations about, oops, thank you. The conversations about suicide prevention in the United States are happening at an opportune time. The U.S. just published this prioritized research agenda for suicide prevention in 2014 with an ambitious goal of seeing that suicide 
could be reduced by 20% in the U.S. over the next five years should the research and uh, resultant policy and services uh, interventions be implemented and an ambitious goal of seeing a 40% reduction over the next 10 years in the United States, again, given that we can implement what we know needs to happen. At the same time, the WHO published earlier in 2014 its World Suicide Report, also setting ambitious targets and looking at what are the regional differences around the world and what can we learn as a global community to address suicide. And I just want to highlight a, a couple of cross-cutting themes in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. research agenda that are relevant, I think, to the to Arctic countries. One is a, a positive approach, so testing approaches that actually initiate and maintain healthy behaviors that can lead to reduction in risk. Testing interventions that are aimed at reducing risk factors, but also using technology to figure out how to facilitate social connections and help seeking. Um, using practical studies, practical trials to determine the benefits of quality improvement in healthcare systems. So recognizing that these interventions need to happen in the context of quality uh, mental health service delivery and quality healthcare delivery. And finally, recognizing that these are interventions that need to take place intersectorally. So adapting and testing components within other systems that are, that are responsible for um, health, including housing, justice, education, et cetera. So I spent some days a few weeks ago in Iqaluit, uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research uh, sponsored a meeting of report out on the mental wellness uh, project that they did underneath the Canadian chairmanship. And it was a great discussion. The Canadians uh, sponsored a couple of teams to do an environmental scan of available interventions that are being implemented in communities that communities find promising, particularly looking to see what is it that indigenous communities in the circumpolar Arctic find most important and what, are, what do they consider practice, what do they consider um, promising interventions. They also looked to see though what were the evidence-based interventions and some of the lessons that came from this, this, uh, this conversation were that solutions need to be culturally grounded. They need to be community-based and community-driven. There was a lot of discussion around the importance of intervention specificity for communities. This was important for communities to recognize that this is not a one-size-fits-all. These solutions need to, be, need to be adapted for context. What's the importance of culturally appropriate shared interventions across communities? So how can one learn from simply implementing the mental health services that are needed, for example, how can we learn from intersectoral cooperation that would benefit multiple communities? Another takeaway was that the solutions, studies of these problems need to be solution-focused instead of problem-focused. So again, how do we focus on health? How do we focus on strengthening health, um, even while we're trying to reduce risk and reduce bad outcomes? Communities, clinicians, governments, and others need to know what works in order to know what to implement more widely. And a number of questions arose uh, about how do we do that? How do we make sure that communities, how do we know how communities define what works? That's not always the same as the way researchers define what works. How do decision makers define what works and where do these different perspectives actually intersect? Um, and finally, as I mentioned, they noted that there were few studies of interventions with a rigorous evaluation. So opportunities that we see um, from the U.S. perspective for building on the Canadian activities, first of all, acknowledging that these kinds of challenging problems need shared knowledge and tailored efforts. But when we're tailoring interventions, how can we also be sure that others are learning from those interventions? And if your interventions are successful, what's required to, for implementation? And once an, implement, once an intervention is implemented, how can one ensure that the intervention can be sustained? So how can the results of successful interventions be communicated to decision makers to aid sustainability? And one answer may come in how we approach testing the efficacy of these interventions, um, and that includes figuring out how can we harmonize outcome measures to provide a shared language to communicate to different stakeholders. 
an important issue uh, arose in the conversations in Iqaluit, and that is that if we, if we want to think about wellness and health, there are many slices to the pie. And so focusing on the health sector alone is not sufficient. One also has to think about e the economic sector, and we've talked about this today, economy, education, the physical environment, climate, and also remembering social history and how that influences the way that people respond to current um, challenges. So the U.S. proposed uh, project under the Arctic Council is called Reducing the Incidence of Suicide in Indigenous Groups, Strengths United Through Networks, or Rising Sun. And the context for this is remembering that, as I've shown you in the first slides, there's an elevated risk of suicide in these remote rural Arctic communities. We also are talking about communities with considerable cultural diversity and often very small populations. So the standard approaches that researchers tend to use to evaluate the, the efficacy and the effectiveness of interventions is quite challenging. So what might be a way to get around some of those things? There are also some important assumptions, and those are that Efforts also have to continue, of course, beyond what's proposed under the, the U.S. chairmanship and under the Sustainable Development Working Group specifically, and that these proposed projects like Rising Sun can move the agenda forward, but they have to happen in concert with broader ongoing efforts for service delivery, for research, and for these other intersectoral interventions as well. So some of the questions that Rising Sun um, hopes to answer are, can lessons about the impact of suicide prevention interventions be learned from information across more than one Arctic community? Would this be facilitated by identifying common measures to assess the outcomes of interventions? And what are some of the underlying themes that are most frequently measured across these interventions? So what might this look like? We know that there is a big body of existing interventions out there, some of which were highlighted in Canada a few weeks ago. And those interventions target policies. Some of them target health systems. Some of them are clinics-based. Some of them are more community-level interventions that are focusing on you know, bringing youth in particular back, to, back, to, back in touch with their cultural traditions. And some of them are focused at individual levels. And so what we hope to do is prepare a toolkit that takes into account these various levels of intervention and meaningful outcome measures um, that can be used to harmonize the evaluation across sites, that could enable communities to measure what's relevant to their needs, and that would enable the sharing and comparing of data across studies of effectiveness. And this, we hope, will be able to be uh, amenable for community use uh, that will and will take into consideration what communities value in terms of outcomes, that will take into consideration the kinds of data that um, sub-national governments are currently using and value in terms of outcomes, and that will also use the expertise of researchers who are working on methods appropriate for this kind of, this kind of uh, evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. Uh, Dr. Michael Bruce. CDC. Let's see, can we pull up the slides? Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for having me here uh, to speak to you today about CDC's role and activities uh, in regards to human health in the Arctic and the subarctic. So the, I'm, I'm going to work off a series of slides. So. Um, this is a slide that shows you sort of CDC's assets in the Arctic, and, and I work for the Arctic Investigations Program, 33 people total. Uh, we also have a quarantine station there focused on infectious diseases. Um, we have uh, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health Office there, and we also have an ATSDR office. Um, so our mission at Arctic Investigations Program is to prevent infectious disease morbidity and mortality in peoples of the Arctic and the subarctic with a special emphasis on diseases of high incidence and concern among indigenous people. Our priority areas are surveillance of infectious diseases, emerging infectious diseases, reducing health disparities, preparedness and response, and leadership in circumpolar health. 
So I'm going to go through some of our circumpolar activities right now. One of them is uh, international circumpolar surveillance. And we're the headquarters for a circumpolar network looking at different infectious diseases across the Arctic. That map shows you in the darker color the countries that participate in the invasive bacterial disease surveillance network. And we've recently added TB on. So if it was a map showing TB, Russia would be included also. Um, some of the things that have come out of this network are we've been able to identify outbreaks of infectious diseases across the different countries. We've also been able to identify new dangerous emerging infections in these countries. And <clears throat> we've actually been working over the past decade to identify a new emerging infection called Haemophilus influenza serotype A that has a case fatality rate of about 10% in our children. And we've worked closely with the Canadians in particular, where the Canadians have quite high disease rates also, um, to, to work on this issue. Uh, we also work with the International Union for Circumpolar Health. I'm the former president of the union. Um, we also work with the American Society for Circumpolar Health that I'm also the former president of. And we work mainly through a variety of different infectious disease working groups. And these uh, working groups fall within the union's purview. Uh, we also work uh, with the U.S. Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, or IARCPIC. There's a CDC rep from our office that co-chairs that meeting, and uh, Dr. Roger Glass, I believe, also co-chairs from, from Fogarty and NIH, and he's here today. Uh, <clears throat> we also work with the Arctic Council. Uh, particularly, we have a representative from our group that's a member of the Arctic Human Health Experts Group. And that has been Dr. Alan Parkinson, but is now going to be Dr. Tom Hennessy, who's my boss and the director of the Arctic Investigations Program. And the uh, AHHEG advises the Sustainable Development Working Group of the Arctic Council. And then we've been working on a number of other health initiatives in Alaska. Uh, one is the Alaska Water and Sewer Challenge. And I'll tell you more about that in some subsequent slides. But one of the things that we're trying to do is to take a, a local Alaska-specific initiative to improve water distribution and sewage, um, uh, sewer system availability um, to people and, and internationalize it and expand it to our international partners. We also work within a group called the One Health Working Group uh, in Alaska that's um, led by the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. And that's really looking at the intersection of human, animal, and environmental health. So I'm going to speak just briefly about water, sanitation, and health in Alaska. In Alaska, we're pretty far behind, at least in terms of rural Alaska, in terms of the percentage of, of homes with complete plumbing. And if you look at this graph, you can see that on the x-axis is decade, on the y-axis is percentage of homes with complete plumbing. In the U.S., we went from about 55% in 1940 up to 100% in, in, this, in the lower 48 states. Alaska is pretty high, but when you look at rural Alaska, as of 2010, if you draw a line across, we're where the U.S. was in 1959 in terms of plumbing. So we're, we're pretty far behind. And these are some pictures of a village in rural Alaska. About 25% of villages in rural Alaska have no running water or sewer. And so the picture on the upper left-hand corner is a person going to a water distribution point, filling a plastic bucket with water, and then on the upper right, he'll take that bucket back to his home and dump it in a big garbage, plastic garbage can. And that's their water source in the home. That's where they pull their water out of. Down on the lower left is the toilet. That's what we call a honey bucket. It's a bucket with a toilet seat on it, and you can see the, the right side picture next to it. Someone is emptying that into a receptacle. They have to carry that bucket through the village, slosh it around, spill, and dump it into the receptacle. In the winter, it gets very cold in Alaska. That freezes. They dump those frozen blocks into the sewage lagoon. In Alaska, we call those poopsicles. Um, so if, if you're rationing water in the village, your priority is going to be for drinking and for cooking. And there's going to be a much lesser priority for personal hygiene, washing clothing, and cleaning the home. When people think about waterborne disease, most people think about pathogens in the water causing illness. 
We think that in Alaska, water-washed diseases are probably of greater importance. That is, people rationing water, they're not washing their hands, there's lack of water for hygiene, and that um, allows for person-to-person -person transmission of a variety of different infectious diseases. And we've done a number of different studies in Alaska. This is just one slide. On the x-axis, you can see proportion of homes served with, with piped water. On the y-axis, you can see rates of invasive pneumococcal disease, a very, very serious illness, and that's in children less than five in Alaska. And you can see that in, in villages with less than 10% of running water, that the invasive pneumococcal disease rates are astronomically high, almost 400 per 100,000. But as the water service increases, the rates of disease go down. And we've seen this for a number of other diseases also. Um, so <clears throat> increasing the proportion of Alaskans with access to in-home water and wastewater services is quite important to Alaskans. It's one of the 25 leading health indicators for Healthy Alaskans 2020. Uh, at baseline in 2010, about 78% of rural homes had running water. Uh, our target for 2020 is 87%, and I pulled this right off the web. That um, red stop sign symbol means we're not on target to reach our 87% of water, of, of water distribution systems to rural homes, which is a bit alarming. One of the things that we've done um, in response to this, that it actually isn't me, it's the uh, Devar Department of an Environmental uh, Conservation at the, the state of Alaska, has put forth the Alaska Water and Sewer Challenge. And this is the website you can see listed down at the bottom there if you want more information on this. But basically, this is a challenge that was put out to ask for teams to come together and propose decentralized water distribution systems for rural Alaska. There are many places in rural Alaska that will never have piped water, where the substrate is, is you can't put in pipes. There are other places where it probably isn't affordable. Um, and so we need some alternate uh, technologies, um, some innovative technologies to help us with this. So these, these uh, teams, uh, they're, they're, the work that they do is private sector driven. They need to be able to provide sufficient water for health. It needs to be affordable for the homeowner, feasible capital cost, long-term operability, um, and uh, they need to get user input from communities. So right now they're evaluating these six teams. They're gonna hone it down to three teams. And those three teams' proposals are going to be implemented in rural villages. And we're gonna look over a period of year to see how they do in terms of health outcomes, in terms of engineering, did it work, and then in terms of acceptability within the community. Um, and so that's, that's actually ongoing right now. Um, and then this is this, one of my last slides, is uh, just thinking about the upcoming US chairmanship of the Arctic Council and uh, our water and sanitation initiative. I guess some of the deliverables that uh, we have for this are we're planning on a white paper looking at water and sanitation across the Arctic, um, looking at populations within home water service and looking at related health indicators and challenges uh, and proposed solutions. Um, we're gonna be traveling, I'm gonna be traveling in less than two months to the Finland uh, International Congress on Circumpolar Health in which we're gonna discuss this with our international partners. And we're planning on a circumpolar water and sanitation conference bringing together circumpolar partners and sort of inter internationalizing the Alaska water and sewer challenge for all of the Arctic. And we're sponsoring that in Anchorage, uh, sponsored by the state of Alaska in September of 2016, looking for innovations in water distribution for small communities. Uh, we have many partners uh, in this effort that I have uh, listed up here. And for the sake of time, I'll say thank you, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much, Michael. Timothy? Yeah, we're going to pass the keyboard down. <laughs> there you are. Is the studio to address it in? Yeah. I like that picture. <laughs> the fish was that big. Oh, maybe you go, go the other way. Go the other way. Go the other way. Go the other way. 
Do they love it? Oh, can I ask why you did? No, sorry, we needed to load your slide first. Thank you. Oh, we may not hit the right button. There's always the technology challenge. Oh, okay. Why don't you just start your presentation and we'll catch up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Ad lib. Uh, yes. Um, yes, I've been asked to talk about uh, the Arctic Human Development Report, which um, just recently came out. Uh, as, as Heather said, it was, uh, I guess it came out a couple months ago, but it's dated 2014. And this is the second Arctic Human Development Report. The first one was published in 2004. Um, and one of the things, it, well, it, oh, I guess I'm going through my slides already. Um, it, it's, it was put together by a number of different uh, teams. There's some 27 lead authors, three um, lead editors, um, very international team drawing from um, uh, across, the, across the Arctic. Here we go. Yay. Oh, she took the keyboard. She's going to okay. bring it back. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, across the Arctic, uh, and this is not a, a research report necessarily. It's it's more of a kind of a, a review of research that other people have done. So yeah, okay, it was done under the auspices of the Sustainable Development Working Group. We have a number of target audiences. Um, one of them was obviously the Arctic Council, um, policymakers in the Arctic, other people interested in the Arctic like yourselves. And what we found is um, from the first Arctic Human Development Report that uh, the University of Arctic, other northern colleges and universities use this report um, rather extensively. These are the different chapters in the Arctic Human Development Report. I'm the, the lead author of the chapter on Arctic populations and migration. I'll pull a little bit from that. But I'm going to really focus on the, the chapter on human health and well-being by um, Ari, Ari Rioto, Bira Popel, and Q Young. We had a, a, a number of guiding questions that the authors and author teams were asked to address. Um, one was, how, how does the Arctic uh, differ from the outside world, from the, the core of the, of the Arctic states, um, certainly look at issues of ethnicity, indigeneity, um, and how those affect the populations of the Arctic. Climate change was a factor also. Um, and certainly regional variations among the different parts of the Arctic, and I'll certainly highlight some of those. And then also this last bullet point, um, how did the, what were the changes over roughly the first uh, decade of the, of the 20th century since the first Arctic Human Development Report. Um, but focusing on, on health disparities, um, or, or health, um, the issue of disparities, continuing health disparities is, is obviously an issue that um, some of the previous speakers highlighted, but this chapter, that's a, a trend that's it's highlighted in, in a number of different places. Um, disparities among countries, among regions, and certainly this disparity between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. Um, and the, I, I pull this this chap or this uh, section from the report, and I think it's in in Heather's report also. This kind of different grouping: the Nordic countries, high overall health indicators, uh, not large disparities, not large disparities between um, the different peoples, um, and then the, uh, the kind of Western North American Arctic, rather good health indicators overall, but. Again, these disparities between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples, Greenland and Nunavut, uh, the two kind of Inuit regions, again, high disparities between those places in Canada and Denmark, and then the Russian Arctic, which I'll highlight overall um, you know, poor health indicators in, in general. Um, and this is from uh, just one short example. This is from Q. Young's um, Circumpolar Health Atlas. I hope you can see that. What he does is he, he contrasts infant mortality between Greenland and Denmark, and basically the story is Greenland is some 30 years behind Denmark in reducing um, infant mortality. Obviously, the two lines um, converge rather nicely, but uh, there's a 30-year a, a or a generation gap. Um, this is from uh, uh, my chapter, again, highlighting some of these, these regional disparities among the 27 or so Arctic regions, and you can see here there's a, a huge difference between the Faroe Islands, Iceland, some of these places, um, and then going down to Chukotka, and I, I, again, to make this international comparison, I put the world more developed and less developed regions, and this is according to the UN definition, but you can, like I say, this huge difference down to Chukotka where you have a life expectancy of 58 years, large difference between men and women, life expectancy for men is 53 years. Um, 
And one of the factors that drives a lot of the, the, the overall disparities is the, the differences between uh, men and women. Um, on the left side are some of the Russian regions where men or where women outlive men by over a decade. Um, and these are some extremely large um, differences, possibly some of the largest in the world. And the, the point is when you have roughly half of your population with a low life expectancy, you're going to have obviously a low overall life expectancy. Um, infant mortality shows somewhat the same trends. Um, uh, the highest rates of infant mortality are in some of these uh, predominantly indigenous uh, regions or countries, Greenland, Nunavut, and Chukotka, going down to um, you know, places like Iceland and, and some of the Nordic countries, which are really having among the lowest um, levels of infant mortality uh, in the world. Um, but just one thing I want to highlight, I, I put the whole world and then less developed countries to show even though these are high relatively to, to some of these countries, I mean the Arctic, in the Arctic regions actually, um, you know, exist within highly developed high income countries. So there's possibly some, um, some hope or something that can be drawn upon there. Apologize for the quality of this graph, but I, uh, basically the point. This shows the trends in TB across some of the um, circumpolar regions. And the, the first one is the Canadian Inuit, I guess Greenland and Alaska natives. And you can see the, the large declines in TB, but you know, kind of continued disparities um, in 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 TB. Um, and this, and uh, the, the, one of the previous speakers talked about suicide. Um, and this is from some work that Jack Hicks has done um, looking at suicide rates in Canada and then among the Inuit in, in Nunavut. And you can see the, the trend for Canada is relatively flat, whereas the trend for Inuit in, in uh, Nunavut has, has continued to go up. And he, he, luckily Jack is a rather cheerful guy, this is rather depressing research to do, but um, he, he he, he correlates this with various historical events, and he also points out kind of the clustering of suicides. I mean, if there's one, there tends to be um, several. And this is from some work that I did. This shows the, the sex ratio, the ratio of males to females um, in Russia. So this is 1989, just prior to the breakup of the Soviet, Soviet Union. You can see most of the Arctic, the northern regions, have a, a much higher male sex ratio than um, the rest of the country, and this is because of the, the demands of industry. In northern industry, trying to draw more more men than women, and as the the Steve introduced, I, I do a lot of research on migration. So I was looking at these changing sex ratios in the Arctic. I thought, well, I'll be telling a migration story that men would cope with the kind of the downsizing of the the Arctic or the northern economy by migrating out. And what happens here is you can see a declining male sex ratio, but it's not due to migration. Only about a quarter of that is due to migration. Three quarters of it is due to the fact that men are dying in much larger numbers than women in the Russian north. And if we keep going down, this male sex ratio um, continues to decline. And th th these gaps in life expectancy, I mean, Russia overall has among the highest um, female advantages in life expectancy in some of these regions, it's, it's extraordinarily high, and I, I speculate that it's probably the, among the highest um, in the world. Um, the first Arctic Human Development Report really focused on, um, on health, and the chapter was called Health and Well-Being, but this one really tries to push that a little bit and, and look a little bit more broadly at, at all indicators of well-being, and I think one of the previous speakers talked about suicide intervention has to go beyond just um, looking at what the health or healthcare sector can do. Um, it's probably hard to read, but the, sh the charts on the right basically show um, the trends in GDP and the trends in life, ex or life expectancy over the first decade of the, of the 20th century. The green shows improvement, red shows a decline. And for most of the Arctic countries, there you know, has generally been um, an improvement in life, uh, or improvement in both, in, in life expectancy and and in GDP, um, and but the, there's, oh, I won't go into detail, maybe if you're interested, but there's the, what the Arctic Human Development Report, there's subsequent reports to that. They take the, th the UN Human Development Index, th the three um, components of that, but then they try to add some others that are kind of Arctic specific, fate control, culture, identity, 
um, language retention, closest to nature, things that are kind of important specifically to people in the Arctic. Um, so to conclude, um, there has been a lot of research on, on health and health well-being of indigenous peoples. The previous speakers talked about that in this chapter, and the report talks about that. There's been a number of different research uh, intervention efforts underway to improve the health and well-being um, of people in the Arctic. I mean, one, one of the takeaway messages in the report is that there has been, you know, considerable improvement in, in a lot of areas of health. I pointed out life expectancy and some of these others. But there are some issues, uh, health issues in the Arctic that remain rather, rather intractable. When I showed about suicide, TB, and some others, uh, some sexually transmitted diseases, domestic violence, that just don't really show any, any sign of improvement. And I think the, the CSIS report also talked about the, the warming climate and how this may um, uh, impact water, food security, uh, certainly some infectious diseases and things like that. And lastly, um, Senator Murkowski talked about the importance of, of um, uh, educating the, the next generation about the, about the Arctic, um, and then I think some other speakers um, mentioned that as well. So I'll, I'll finish with this slide. This shows my young two-year-old daughter looking at the Arctic Human Development Report when it came in. Notice the smile on her face and, and the thrill with, with this. She was actually born and raised kind of during my writing of, of this whole thing. So I'll stop there and take any questions that you may have. Um, thanks very much. Um, we've heard a lot about suicide. We've heard a lot about water and sanitation, both with respect to the work underway specific to Alaska, but also work that is underway in the broader Arctic Council context. So I take that to mean, from certainly the CDC and NIH perspective, that these are the areas where there's the greatest promise and there's a, an agenda formed up and, 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 a, and a way forward. Um, I also took away from listening to your presentations and listening to Tim that we need to be quite realistic, that <clears throat> there, are, there are some significant barriers to really carrying forward that agenda or other broader infectious disease agendas. The huge variation. Uh, 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 as you've pointed out, huge variation uh, culturally, demographically, uh, ge geographically, um, very significant differences um, across these different communities and across these different sovereign entities. We didn't talk much about what the political barriers might be in terms of getting cooperation within the council on some of these very sensitive and culturally, culturally based uh, problems. Uh, and we didn't hear much about the questions of prioritization um, across the constituent governments that we're talking about. To what degree are these issues, as sub-issues within a broader health spectrum, to what degree are these becoming prioritized? And to what degree is there political will and financial resources and commitments to try and move this agenda forward? So on the one hand, we have the U.S. coming into the chairmanship next week. We have these, this body of work out there. We have the human development report out. There's a lot of new content to move forward. There's a lot of active, ongoing work. But um, what, can we real, what should we realistically expect in the, two -year, the period of the two-year chairmanship in moving the agenda forward, both at home in the state of Alaska, but on the broader context uh, of the Arctic Council? Um, Maybe I could ask Pamela and Michael to say a few words about sort of what your hope is, given that mix of both opportunities that have arisen, all of the good work that you've done, and, and, and some of the questions around what, what is this environment, what are we likely to see in this period? What, how do we set our, our compasses in a realistic way? Pamela you and Michael? Well, I think one important aspect of the U.S. chairmanship is actually bringing attention to these issues. So bringing attention to the mental health needs in the Arctic and Alaska, specifically bringing attention to where the uh, risks are, bringing attention to what, what resources we have to build on. So that's one important issue. Um, from the 
NIH certainly will continue to fund research to try to answer some of these questions in Alaska specifically and um, as well as in other, in other sites as relevant. Um, but I think that's a big one, and I, and I think the, the opportunity to have a mental health project as one of the sustainable development working group projects um, invites this collaboration across countries to address some of these issues. So as I mentioned in the presentation, the project under the sustainable development working group is one such thing, but certainly within HHS, with respect to mental health interventions, um, the substance abuse and mental health services administration continues to support work on service delivery for mental health as well as for, sub for uh, substance abuse and for suicide prevention. They, in fact, just released an RFA earlier this month for tribal communities on suicide prevention intervention. So, so to make a long story short, there are many things happening in concert, but I think this is a great platform to bring attention to an area that often does not get the kind of attention it needs in the, in the global health context, particularly, um, and with respect to thinking about the disparities in, in mental health that are clearly evident. So you feel that you do feel that the, ri the groundwork has been done in terms of the rising sun, a consensus among the, the constituent governments of the Arctic Council that, that this framework has, there is a buy-in for this framework, a preliminary buy-in to move this forward? So, so when you say groundwork, in, so yes, this has been a proposed project that has been reviewed by the various members yes. of the Arctic Council, and that at this point we do have buy-in from, uh, from countries that would like to join us in this work, so we're looking forward and to And what that. is it going to take, in your estimation, to bring, it, to bring it to life and carry it forward, would you say? So for that specific project, there will be, it will take country partners that will commit funds to move yes. that project forward, and I think we're expecting some of those kinds of commitments to occur, and we'll certainly hear more about that after the U.S. officially um, assumes the chairmanship. So yes, so yes. commitment of time, <laughs> commitment of funds, commitment of uh, expertise, and commitment of um, helping us to gain access to those networks out there that bring access not only to the experts, but also to the community members who we hope to engage in this process as well. Thank you. Michael, on the Arctic Water and Sanitation Initiative, if you could say a few words about how much consensus exists today and what's it going to take to really move this forward in the next two years. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I, I would um, second um, Pam's comments in terms of increasing and strengthening our collaboration with our international circumpolar partners. I've been working in the Arctic now for, it's my 16th year, and, and when we started the circumpolar surveillance system, it brought us together focused on invasive bacterial diseases. But there's a lot more out there beyond just a narrow focus on infectious diseases. And I think broadening that with our partners is very important, but with a focus on health. Um, and so we've, we've tried to address many of the health, a number of different health issues in Alaska, but our current focus is on water and sanitation. And one of the reasons for that is that, uh, I said a little bit about it earlier, is that we, we have piped water to about 78% of those rural villages, but there's a significant portion that don't have it and may never get it. So, so what do we do? Well, one of the interim steps that we had taken was to develop small haul water systems into these villages. So if you have a small haul tank in your home, um, you can truck water to the home and fill the tank, and you can have faucets, and you can have a shower, and you can have some water in the home in that respect. But as it turns out, that model um, doesn't deliver a lot of water into the home. And so what we've learned is that homes that have honey buckets, that have basically no system other than a central watering point where you go fill up buckets, um, they deliver about 1.5 gallons of water per person per day. If you have a small haul system, they deliver about two and a half gallons of water per person per day. 
Now, the WHO recommends a minimum of 13 to 15 gallons of water per person per day. And if you look at what our use is in the United States in general, uh, we generally use about 50 gallons per person per day. So our villages uh, in, in Alaska are, are, are doing extreme, extreme water rationing. And we know that this isn't just true for Alaska. There are other areas in the Arctic um, some of our other neighbors in the Arctic and northern Canada, in Greenland and northern Russia, also have issues with remoteness and water and sanitation. And so what we're hoping to do, and we've done this with circumpolar surveillance, is we're hoping, we, we've learned many things from our, our circumpolar partners. We're hoping that this Alaska initiative on water and sanitation that I explained to you a little bit earlier can potentially be used as a model and help in pushing that model forward to develop these technologies across the Arctic. So. Thank you. Tim, uh, this 10-year study, I mean, this, the, the, the new study for the first time in a, de in a decade, it's very comprehensive, it's, it's, it's encyclopedic. Um, how is it gonna be used on the health front, in your view? How is it actually going to be used by the leadership of the Arctic Council to move an agenda forward? Well, oops, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not exactly sure, um, but it's, I, I think one of, the, one of the things we were supposed to do is to highlight some of these, these differences and to put this out there in front of them and say, um, you know, especially since this was the second Arctic Human Development Report, the first was really kind of a stock taking. I mean, there, were, there wasn't a lot known. Um, and like I said, this wasn't necessarily new research. It was kind of pulling together existing data, um, pulling together from a number of scientific studies. And like I said, one of our mandates was to look at um, some of the trends over time. And all of the chapters do that, economic chapter, my chapter, the, certainly the health chapter. And so I think what we've done is we've, so we've looked basically over the first decade of the 20th century since the first Arctic Human Development Report and said, okay, we, we identified and hopefully I've brought some of these out. Okay, these are the areas that, you know, there's generally been improvement. We don't necessarily have targets, but if we're, you know, things are um, getting better in certain areas. But we've, th this chapter has certainly highlighted areas where there hasn't been improvement. There hasn't been improvement. Um, in specific Arctic regions or across the Arctic, and certainly the, the issue of suicide and, and some of these others that I mentioned are kind of intractable diseases. I mean, the issue of domestic violence keeps coming up um, again and again. Um, so hopefully, you know, the Arctic Council, other people uh, interested in the Arctic, you know, can look at this and say, okay, these areas are, are getting better, but there's other, there's other areas that are, are actually not getting better, and, and those are maybe the areas that we need to there needs to be some focus on. And Heather, could you say a few words about the U.S. calculation in this? I mean, you know the policy environment here. You know the history of U.S. engagement on these Arctic issues. You talk all the time with the administration around these issues. What can we, what can we hope for in this next phase in terms of prioritization and leadership uh, on these issues? And, and, Will they take up your recommendations? Well, here's hoping. Um, well, you know, I, I think that the, the really disappointing thing, um, I guess it was about 12 or 18 months ago, it was put forward to the Office of Management and Budget to create a budget for the U.S. chairmanship so that there would be extra funds that would be given to implementing some of these key priorities. Unfortunately, OMB said that was not a good idea and that budget does not exist. So what is happening is we have these fantastic priorities, uh, but agencies, this is again the theme that we raised with Senator Murkowski, they're going to have to use existing resources, try to squeak, reprioritize, and we know in this budget scarcity this is really difficult. So that was sort of step one. We missed a huge opportunity that we're, I think what the U.S. chairmanship is going to be is a lot of really good projects, piloting projects, modeling projects that we will showcase, but quite frankly, the funding will just not be sufficient to boost them. Great work being done, but boy, they need some turbocharged um, budget. Now, I never like to end on a pessimistic note. So the White House did, uh, 
has a new body in place, the Arctic Executive uh, Steering Group, which is led at very senior levels. This group has been charged uh, with doing a gap analysis. So it's, um, if you uh, dared to read the um, White House's implementation plan for the national strategy for the Arctic region, short little uh, title, um, you, we do see where in the implementation plan there are clear outlines for, and I quote, to coordinate better comprehension of the health and survival rates of Arctic indigenous peoples to facilitate improvements in well-being that as an objective. So I'm hoping this gap analysis says we have, you know, uh, the U.S. chairmanship theme is Arctic uh, improvements and Arctic economic and living and well-being con uh, uh, conditions. We have some great things, but there are not funding. We are going to prioritize this, and we are going to put funding, I would argue, as a domestic priority for the state of Alaska. Uh, it is an absolute tragedy to hear some of the figures that you have cited. It, it's, a, it's appalling. It's unacceptable. Leadership begins at home. We need to start focusing our time and attention on Americans uh, that are, are suffering uh, from, from these conditions. And then exactly, we need to pull this out and, and provide that leadership uh, effort circumpolar. Uh, Pam, my concern about the Sustainable Development Working Group, the SDWG, it is the, it, it is the mothership of the working groups. It's a monster working group. And, and that's where I think it gets stuck because it does so much. That's why I think it's absolutely vital that we pull this out and say, look, if we're serious about this, we're going to put those resources, we're going to hold those uh, Arctic governments to account and say, let's put that money in. And my frustration, Tim, quite frankly, with the Arctic uh, Human Development Part, it's not an Arctic Council product. It's not. That's a problem, because if it's not a product, you go, that's a lovely report. Thank you very much. And then we can keep on going to our, our regular business. This is exactly what we need, these wonderful assessments and reports. We need to hold governments accountable for how are they moving the measure. I love that stop sign. The Arctic Council needs that graph and those stop signs. You promised this. You ministers, you signed and you said, we agree with this. But our governments have done nothing about it. Who's holding them accountable? And this is part of the Arctic Council's governance requirement, but it comes from leadership from, from national councils. I think we have an opportunity uh, here, and, and, it's, and to raise public awareness, absolutely, but we must start making the tough budget choices. As, as Senator Rakowski, you know, show me, show me that money. And so far we've tried, we've said it's important, but we haven't reflected that it's important in our budgets. It begins with our budgets, and I would encourage OMB to be much more generous, this is so easy for me to say, from CDC and NIH and Health and Human Services, we've got to start addressing these challenges. Thank you very much. Let's move to our audience. Uh, we've got 15 minutes. Let's collect um, several, uh, uh, bundle together several interventions. We have one here, one here, and one there. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, please be, please identify yourself, be very succinct, and offer a quick comment or question. John Farrell, Arctic Research Commission. First of all, I completely support your recommendation, Heather. Thank you, uh, bless you, sister. I would take health out of SDWG as fast as I possibly could. <laughs> it really does. That SDWG has too many things in it. it does. Also, structurally, it should not, in my personal opinion, be head of delegation, should be a foreign service officer who is just brand spanking new every two years into this. That causes difficulties. In, and, and the other foreign ministries do the same thing. Yeah. So we really need to get subject matter experts on SDWG for this and specifically on health. Uh, Dr. Collins, thank you so much. I'm very pleased to see NIMH involved in this activity. It's a challenge. Part of the tyranny of focusing on suicidality in the North is the small numbers of people. Mm -hmm. You can have discussions in Fogarty, other places, and they will point to the large numbers of deaths in Sub-Sahara Africa. So if you're, advoc if you're allocating funds, you try to know where the large numbers of people are. But these are US citizens. So I'm greatly appreciative of the initiatives you're doing there, but a question for you is, you mentioned rigorous evaluations. SAMHSA funds a lot of services. Some people would argue that's really not looking at the root cause research-wise in terms of suicidality. We tried at the commission unsuccessfully to get an IOM, Institute of Medicine study, focusing on this, and we failed because we did not adequately engage with Alaska Native communities in developing this and explaining what an IOM study was, explaining how committees 
are formed and how editorial control is done, do you think an IOM study, if we tried it again, would be a useful way to do a rigorous evaluation of this issue in the North? And loaded on in that question is, very hard to get capacity, even if you have money oriented towards these problems, hard to get capacity. There's no medical school in Alaska. There's not a lot of investigators down in the lower 48 who are capable or interested in an R01 grant in this kind of work. So an IOM and how do we build capacity even if there is funding? Thank you, sir. And then. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, Charles Newstead, State Department. And I hasten to add, I'm speaking for myself, not the department, where I find myself in the basement without a telephone. I'm very impressed, first a comment, I'm very impressed by the broad scope and expertise that this panel represents. It's truly impressive. And I'm also very impressed with the way that you and your colleagues have brought international cooperation into play in dealing with the Arctic. That's vitally important. Heather mentioned the main thing is money and the bottom line. And I found, in, and I think most people agree with this, that international scientific cooperation is a great multiplier on what you can do with your budget. So I applaud your efforts in that way. And now my specific question, I'm wondering if the panel could compare in their various different fields the health situation in Russia and various regions compared with that in the West with uh, Alaska, Canada, Greenland, etc. And final question is, has Mr. Putin made, he's trying to become a czar again, as we all know, has he had some effect on the Arctic yet? Is that discernible? And is that good or bad? Thank you so much. Uh, there was a hand. In, in. Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, Linda Fernandez, Virginia Commonwealth University. I have a question for Michael Bruce, and it's largely, um, it's a question combined with a suggestion. You did mention a circumpolar water sanitation conference scheduled for next year. Uh, perhaps as a result of what would be a success of the Alaska Water and Sewer Challenge that's going to be magnified to the Pan-Arctic. I guess I have a suggestion as well as a question. Are you teaming up efforts with all of the international collaborators during World Water Week that's convened in Sweden every year, has great buy-in across a lot of international countries as well as private sector organizations like Rotary International, WHO. It's clear to me that while you've made great strides um, in having the Arctic partners involved, some of what you're suggesting as technology developments on sanitation and water have been addressed in other settings with the um, Arctic partners perhaps engaged differently. So I'd make a suggestion and question whether you can, in fact, synchronize efforts and join in with that group. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments or questions at this time? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Michelle Lerner coming from a sort of different perspective. I work for Bread for the World Institute, and we work on hunger and malnutrition advocacy. So my question is just, um, in general, would you consider that malnutrition or food insecurity, um, lack of money, clearly. Um, how do you think that's impacting the health of people in, in the Arctic? Thank you. OK, so we have a question around, should there be an IOM study? Would that be useful? What's the comparison, Russia versus the West? I think we're going to turn to Tim on that, although everyone here is going to have something to contribute on that. And what impact Putin? What about tying to Water Week in Sweden and then the food insecurity issue? Uh, Michael, why don't we start with you and just sweep down this way? Okay, I think the first question relevant to me was sort of uh, a question from the gentleman from the State Department about the health situation in Russia versus um, other circumpolar nations. And um, I have to say that I, I know very little about, at least in regards to uh, water and sewer in Russia. Uh, and, 
uh, my focus has been in infectious disease, and we've had some collaborations with the Russians in eastern Russia on a number of a variety of different infectious diseases. And I, I know that in, in many of those areas, there are issues with infrastructure, and there's poor infrastructure. So there certainly is a great possibility that there are issues with water distribution and sewage in Russia versus the other countries, but I, I can't tell you for sure. Um, the next question was, um, are we teaming up with um, partners at the World Water Week in Sweden? Um, I'd like to speak to you more about the World Water Week in Sweden because I actually am not aware of that meeting and we probably should be attending. We've had, we've had some of our circumpolar partners in some discussions regarding sanitation and water and health but they haven't been formalized. They, they're through our international collaborations on infectious diseases. So um, I'd be very interested in learning more and we certainly should attend that meeting and learn from them, so thank you. Um, and then from um, the woman at the Barefoot World Institute in regards to food insecurity, uh, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, and food insecurity is, is not something I am a specialist in. I know as an Alaskan that it is an issue, particularly in rural Alaska, in relation to climate change and melting of the permafrost, because many of the native peoples put food in, in, in food lockers buried in the ground in the permafrost, and as the permafrost melts, or as there's increased erosion into the village, those food lockers um, are, are failing. So food insecurity is definitely an issue in rural Alaska uh, as well as other places in the Arctic. And I think I went through the questions. So. Sure, so in response to, uh, to you, John Farrell, I'll start with the research capacity because I think, I think that's critical. Um, in places where you don't have a lot of researchers, one response is to try and develop a cadre of researchers that can actually, that will have some commitment and some insider understanding of the context. So we certainly do need to see more research career development in the context of Alaska. So I would certainly support that. And I think that that means a number of things. That means um, figuring out how to establish mentoring for uh, students, that the idea of pursuing research as a career option becomes a feasible and realistic idea. It means working with institutions um, in order for them to develop an adequate infrastructure and base for training and sustaining uh, young researchers and, and, and researchers throughout their career as well. Um, so yes, I agree that that would be important, particularly in the context of mental health, mental health research. Some of those efforts are underway at NIH where there are initiatives that focus on American Indian and Alaska Native uh, research capacity building, um, and we need to continue those efforts. With respect to the IOM meeting, I think I would probably uh, ask you again, that sounds like how much buy-in is there in the local context for that? So that, to me, that seems like that would be one starting place to make sure that you've got all of your stakeholders in Alaska being of a, of a single mind about pursuing something in that direction, but certainly whatever avenues, whether it's an IOM report, whether it's some other avenue to bring attention to the needs and to, um, to rigorously document where we are with respect to effective interventions in these contexts, that would be, it would be an interesting intervention. Well, just uh, thank you, wonderful questions. Two, two quick comments. Uh, first, a preview of coming attractions. We'll be releasing, hopefully in June, a major study on the Russian Arctic uh, to help us understand. Uh, you heard in the energy panel, Russia has enormous economic stakes in the Arctic. Um, they have a long history uh, in writing very comprehensive and detailed uh, strategies. Some of those strategies, quite interestingly, and Caitlin has uh, been a great student uh, of studying these strategies, 
they do have a very robust sustainable development component, but as the Russian economy continues to experience extraordinary difficulties, um, you know, this, this is going to be a challenge for them to sustain their very ambitious strategies. But we need to understand what's important, uh, why is the Arctic so important to Russia, and I, my uh, thesis is that we have actually seen some significant and certainly disturbing changes in Russia's Arctic policy, uh, particularly uh, after the Crimea, Crimea annexation, um, that, that we need to understand and study that more. So uh, thank you for your question coming to you soon in a, in a comprehensive report. And just one final comment on sort of, you know, the World Water Week, and I think what we're starting to see, and we need to do a much more purposeful job, there's an Arctic diplomacy that is starting to be formulated. So countries that are working together in the uh, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, were so instrumental in pushing through a new mandatory polar code. Could, we are going to see, a, I think, a similar Arctic caucus, those are my words, at the Paris uh, Climate Summit at the end of this year, saying how are we focusing governments because the, the climate change is occurring and the Arctic is occurring two to three times faster than anywhere else in the globe. Could we have in governmental agencies and bodies in water and sanitation, where is the Arctic subgroup that's pushing this agenda? We have to think where issues uh, cr sectorally cross and let's gather the eight Arctic Council members, let's gather the observers if they have a role to play, how can we caucus in these variety of international fora and say let's put the Arctic on the agenda. I think that's a development we need to push whether it's World Water Week or whether it's uh, at these very different UN platforms, where's the Arctic's voice and how can we push the agenda. Thank you. Tim? Um, I'll address the question about um, the comparisons between Russia and the United States in terms of health indicators, life expectancy, et cetera. I mean, I've done a lot of research on Russian demographic issues, and Russia, more so than other countries, seems to be extremely susceptible to economic downturns. Um, you can kind of correlate, uh, you know, economic declines in GDP per capita with declines in life expectancy, certainly after the breakup of the Soviet Union, the kind of economic downturn with the transition, things improved and then things got worse with the 98 ruble crisis. Um, and I haven't checked the numbers, but I think, I think there's been some increase in the death rates over the last year or so with this economic uh, downturn. Um, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say why, but I mean, there's, it just seems to be more, like I said, more so than most other countries. And we had our financial crisis in the late 2000s, and that didn't, you know, life expectancy didn't drop by three or four years all of a sudden because of that. Um, but in Russia, especially among men, I mean, that seems to be a particular uh, trend. And like I highlighted here, um, these gaps in life expectancy between men and women, but overall life expectancy in these Arctic regions, especially if you go up certainly for, further out to the, out into Siberia, they're extremely low. And I, I haven't seen anything where that's a priority of the Russian government um, to address these, some of these issues. Maybe around the margins, but I mean, they, uh, I forget the name of the institute, um, but there was an institute for the. Um, Arctic indigenous peoples, that's been kind of abolished, and it's, it's, I, I just don't think it's a priority like it is in the, in, in the U.S., so I'll end on that pessimistic note. Oh. <laughs> well, we, uh, we've gotten to the end of, uh, end of our time now. Uh, I think this is, just in closing, this is a, a very, in a, in a way, a very opportune year. I mean, we have the, the, the arrival of the U.S. chairmanship. We have the, SD, the sustainable development goals coming forward uh, in, 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 in September. We have the Paris climate change uh, at the end of the year, the summit there. There's a, going to be multiple opportunities to sort of move this forward. I want to thank uh, uh, Tim, uh, Pamela, and Michael for bringing the enormous expertise that you have on uh, in your in your respective areas around the Arctic, it's really been kind of astonishing to to just listen and um, and we know you had to you had to uh, uh, travel a bit of a distance to get here and uh, carve out some time and we're very grateful to you for doing that and Heather, thank you so much for your leadership on all of this. I mean, watching you over the course of this morning has just exhausted me. <laughs> uh, so congratulations <laughs> and thank you, all of you for your great questions and 
comments and your patience in sticking with us. And so thank you all, and we're adjourned. Thank you.